Welcome back, Colin here. I did not place a single object at the level you're looking at, and neither did anybody, because it was built entirely by a program I wrote called MC2GD. Everything in the level comes directly from a real Minecraft world, which was scanned and imported into Geometry Dash. Every Minecraft block has its own unique design for GD, and just for fun, the whole level only uses one color channel. I hope you're intrigued, because now I'm going to waste your time by explaining how it works. MC2GD is actually split into two steps. First, a special data pack needs to be run in the Minecraft world you want to scan. Afterwards, a separate JavaScript program will read the scan results, build a Geometry Dash level out of it, and store it in your save file. If you're interested in trying it out for yourself, you can download the source code off GitHub, which I've linked in the description below. So let's start with the data pack. For those unaware, data packs are essentially little command block scripts that can be added to your Minecraft world. While it's not nearly as powerful as modding, there's still some really cool things you could do with them. I'm actually fairly new to working with data packs, but a friend on Discord by the name of Silith helped me put it together. When you run the data pack, it's going to begin scanning up to a thousand blocks south of your current position. This means that if my X position is 30 and my Z position is 50, it will scan every block with an X of 30 and a Z position between 50 and 1050. Each scan block will have its name and coordinates posted in the chat, resulting in a lot of spam. I'll explain why this is done later on. So what's actually happening during this process? Well, an armor stand is actually visiting each individual block and running the slash loot command on it. Slash loot is a command that simply spawns the loot that a block drops. For example, if I used it on a stone block, I would get cobblestone, since that's what you get for mining it. However, we want the exact block at that position and not the item it drops. To do this, an extra parameter is added to the command to get the loot from the block if you were to mine it with Silk Touch Shears. The shears allow blocks like leaves and vines to be detected, while the Silk Touch enchantment stops blocks like grass from turning to dirt. If no item is dropped from the block, it's then going to try looting it with a Silk Touch Diamond Pickaxe instead. This allows for almost every block to be properly looted, with the exception of unbreakable ones like Bedrock or End Portals. That's why if there's still no item drop, it's going to look through a list of hard-coded exceptions. For example, if the block is Bedrock, say Bedrock in the chat. Once the data pack finishes, all you have to do is close Minecraft and run the actual MC2GD program. This is where things get really interesting. Every time you play Minecraft, a log file is left behind in the game's log folder. Your most recent session is simply saved as a text file, but anything older than that is compressed using gzip, presumably to shrink the file size. The first thing MC2GD does is read your most recent log file, which conveniently holds the name and coordinates of every block that was scanned by the data pack. Now you're probably wondering, oh, but Colin, why can't you just read the world file itself instead of having to waste time using a data pack? It's actually a good question to ask, but, uh, yeah, good luck figuring out how to do that. Once all the block information is acquired, it's going to begin building a geometry dash level out of it. This was by far the most time-consuming part to make, but the actual code is pretty easy. It's just a matter of calculating where to build each block based on its position in Minecraft, then adding it to the GD level's code. If you don't know how to read the code for a Geometry Dash level, it's actually surprisingly simple. Each object is written like this, and they're separated by semicolons. To read the actual data of the object, you simply split it at every second comma. The number on the left is the property of the object, and the number on the right is the value. For example, this object would have an object ID of 1, an X position of 45, a Y position of 60, and would be rotated 90 degrees. If you're wondering how to tell which property is which, well, you don't. It's all documented. But here are the common ones used in MC2GD. The hardest part of all of this was making Geometry Dash versions of over 200 Minecraft blocks. Some of them are fairly straightforward, such as dirt or stone, but others, like the furnace, have a little more going on. The instructions for building each block is saved in a JSON file, which looks like this. Everything here was manually typed by me over the course of about a week, and contains almost all of the naturally generated blocks you'd find in a Minecraft world. Here's how the program reads it. We'll go through an easy block first, and then move to a more complicated one. Let's start with a grass block. Right off the bat, it can be split into two different properties. ID, which is the ID of the Geometry Dash object, and C, which is the color. Every object in Geometry Dash has its own unique ID, which we can use to specify which object we want to place. There's no way to see the object IDs in game, but I wrote a program to build a level that conveniently shows all of them. The grass block has an ID of 952, which would be this one, and sure enough, it works out pretty well. Now for the coloring. The C property contains two sets of numbers, which are the HSV values for the object's base and detail colors. Every object with a C value is red by default, but is then recolored using HSV. It's a lot more convenient than making hundreds of color channels. Once the object is correctly recolored, you have yourself a happy little grass block. Now for a more complicated block. How about the red mushroom? 
First thing you'll notice is that it's actually split up into three different objects. The IDs for them are 1767, 909, and 1608. Let's go one at a time. 1767 is the stem of the mushroom. It doesn't have a C value, so as a result, it stays as the default white color. It has an R value of 90, which means that it should be rotated 90 degrees. And it has a Y value of minus 11, which means that it should be moved 11 spaces down, which is the equivalent to pressing the down button five and a half times. The next object has an ID of 909. It has a C value, but since it's zero, it just stays as red. The Y value of minus four moves it down four spaces, and the S value of 0.7 scales it down to, you guessed it, 0.7. Finally, we have object 1608, which is three little dots. The X value moves it two spaces left, the Y value moves it four spaces down, and the S value scales it to 0.55. It has no C value, so it defaults to white. Put all three objects together, and you have yourself a yummy little mushroom. Just kidding, you probably shouldn't eat wild mushrooms. If you're wondering how I actually built the objects, it's just a matter of making them normally in the editor, getting the IDs and colors of each object, and then adding it to the file. One final thing to note before we move on is that wooden and dyed objects have their colors hard-coded, so that I could simply type brackets wood, and it'll automatically color the block depending on what type it was. Phew, now that that's over, we can finally move on to the final step of MC2GD, adding the level to your save file. Spoilers, it ain't pretty. If you're a Windows user, all of your created levels are stored in appdata slash local slash geometry dash slash cc local levels dot dat. If you open the file, it looks like this mess. That's because it's encrypted. To decrypt it, you have to run an XOR cipher with a key of 11, then decode it from base64, then decode it from gzip compression. If you're not sure what any of that meant, well, it doesn't really matter. Point is, it's encrypted as hell, most likely to keep the file size small, or else account saving would take forever. Weirdly enough, it's actually encrypted differently on Mac, but as of right now, nobody can figure out how to decode it. Sorry, Apple users. Anyways, once the file's decrypted, you get an XML file containing the code and metadata for all your created levels. I won't go into too much detail on how to read it, but pretty much what MC2GD does is sneak the level into the top of the list, and also make it verified just for the meme. Also, we don't need to re-encrypt the save file, because it seems like GD does that for you. Thanks, Robtop. And with all that done, the Minecraft world was successfully imported into Geometry Dash. The whole program runs in about one or two seconds, but as you just saw, there's a lot going on in that short time span. Once the level's imported, you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. I personally really enjoy looking around underground and trying to find diamonds, or better yet, a dungeon. Most of the objects in the level aren't solid, but you can add hitboxes if you want to try making the level playable. Also, since a Geometry Dash level can only be 100 tiles high, and a Minecraft world can be 256, some taller parts of the world might go off the screen. However, since all the objects are on Group 1, this can easily be fixed by placing a move trigger at the start of the level and then playtesting it. And with all that being said, I think that about wraps up everything I hope to go over in this video. If you have any further questions about MC2GD, I'd be happy to answer them in the comments below. Also, if you end up making or finding any cool stuff with the program, by all means, send me a screenshot on Twitter. I'm super active there, and read pretty much everything which mentions me. To those still awake, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time when I import the entirety of Hollow Knight into Geometry Dash. Later, nerds!